Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello dear viewer and dear listener, welcome to yet another exciting episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast and this one is really exciting. We're going to talk about innovation in education and my guest is Miss Dow and uh, I'll let Miss Dow introduce herself. Welcome to the studio ma madam. Thank you, Mr. Mukhobe, and thank mm. you very much for sharing um, your platform and your audience with us. We really appreciate it. Mm. Um, my name is Cheshire Dow, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Dow Academy, which is a basic education service provider in Trudy. So we are preschool, primary, and secondary school. Mm -hmm. In terms of who I am, um, it's a long story, so I'll try to keep it short. Mm. But I actually am from Trudy myself. I'm from actually a walk's distance from where I currently work, being the Dow Academy. I grew up in Muchuli all my life, and I was educated in Muchuli and Habroni, both public and private schools. So I went to Lahaya Primary, but I also went to Simo in Primary, and I went to Westwood towards the end. Mm. Um, for secondary school, my junior certificate was at Bakate CJSS, which is in the same area that I work now. Mm. And for secondary, I finished off at Lahaya Academy in, in Phase Two. Yes. So, and then after basic education, like all, well, like many people from my group, my age mates. We all wanted to go out into the world to see what was out there. Mm -hmm. So I went to university, actually I went to university three times. Mm -hmm. um, the first time was to get a bachelor's in, in economics in the US. And during that time I spent Where some- in the US? In Ohio actually, okay. in the north, very cold. Mm. A private school, small mm. but very, very good actually. I would recommend it to anybody who wants What's to go. What's the name of the school? It's called Kenyon College. Okay. Yes. And then while I was at Kenyon, I spent a year in London, actually uh, my third year at the School of Oriental and African Studies. And then I went back to university to do a Juris Doctorate mm -hmm. in law in the University of Cincinnati. That was three years of my life. Mm. And then while Is there- Is it equivalent to an LLB? Um, well, it depends on who you ask, but arguably in the US when you do law, you have to do a bachelor's first and then law is a graduate degree. So in all in all, it's seven years of education, mm -hmm. of post high school education. And I spent a semester while I was in law school at the University of Cape Town as well, studying law, studying South Africa, studying the Constitution, and all the work that was going on there, that was very exciting. Mm. And then ultimately, um, five or six years ago, I went back one last time to get a, a master's in finance and law. That has been my educational career. I am a huge fan of school. Mm. I'm a huge fan of the opportunities it, open up, it opens up, and if done well, it actually is an amazing thing to do for young people. Yeah. Yes. So you recommend uh, even entrepreneurs to consider doing a master's degree yes. as, a, as a, you know, before they venture into their, their business? I, yeah, I think the thing with, I would recommend it just because we all have blind spots mm. and we all need networks, right? Mm. And master's degree, if nothing else, an opportunity to get together with other similarly minded or innovating or really leading people in different professions and you create better and wider networks. Mm. And we all know business is nothing if it's not about relationships and keeping those alive and maximizing the value of those. So it's an amazing opportunity to actually build new relationships. So I would recommend it from that You point. did a JD, which is equivalent to an LLB, mm. and your mom is a renowned lawyer, judge, and minister. You could easily have taken the law route if you wanted. Mm. There was certainly enough of an example for you to follow. Mm. Why did you pivot away from the legal profession? Um, you know, to be honest, my mother, okay, like you say, my mother is a lawyer and all these um, amazing things, but my father was a teacher. My mother also founded a school. My, father, my mother was a minister of basic education at some point. So while the law profession may be what people see a lot, she's many things. Mm. And, I th and I grew up in a household where really diversity of thought, experience, and curiosity was very much encouraged. Mm. So for me, even if I studied law, I didn't see it as meaning I have to be a lawyer. I saw it as an opportunity to get incredible writing, reading, and analytical skills that could mm -hmm. be used in any profession. Okay. And that's how I approached it, yeah. All right. And the Dow Academy, let's talk about that. Mm. That is the current vehicle you are using, or that's a vehicle that you're devoting your life to. Mm. Um, why did you set it up, and what was the inspiration behind it? Um, 
so there's many reasons why I went into academia. Honestly, I've always loved um, education. I really have. And I, and I always tell my father, because he was a teacher growing up, I always said, you know, if teachers were paid more back then, I would have been a teacher, an early childhood teacher, because I really think it's one of those things that Botswana did well for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that really allowed us to build the country that we have now. And I think it's a promise that needs to be renewed and re looked at often, because as we all know, currently education is not quite meeting the mark in terms of what employers and the world currently needs. Mm -hmm. So for me, even though it took me a long time to get into education, I'm getting into it in my 40s, I think the journey was important because I did have to go into side corporate to understand what corporate wants, what industry wants, and then say on the beginning end, when we're preparing children, are we preparing them to actually do mm. what is mm. right in the business world? So that's why I'm actually in education. And mm. I really think if we're going to make this country better, it's going to be with the kids, the people who are coming up. And mm. while we cannot control what people do as adults, we can show them the options that are available mm -hmm. and inform them to make better choices. And that's just the work that we're doing at the Dow Academy. Are you approaching it as a business or is it just a, a passion, something mm. to fill the time? But do, or do you look at it as an entrepreneurial venture? Mm. I do actually look at it as an entre entrepreneurial venture because ultimately we have the most amazing products, right? We have children. We have four-year-olds that are with us for 13 years. Now, that is an opportunity to create a, a fantastic product. I don't know what is. And the reality is education, like food, like shelter, these are basic things that the world will always need. So as a, as a good, it's a kind of good that is not substitutable. Children need to learn. Doesn't matter what the state of the economy is, children will always need to learn. So for me, as a, a value proposition, it's actually very, very compelling. And more importantly, the, the work needs to be, there needs to be innovation, there needs to be resources put into it. But people aren't going to innovate and put resources if they see value. And the reality is that there is incredible value to be gotten from education institutions. I mean, the big schools that people talk about, Harvard, Yale, those are schools that make a small fortune. Mm. I mean, they produce quality graduates, but the reality is, as a business proposition, anybody would be willing to invest in those make institutions. make money, yes. yes. Mm. They do. And tell us about the school itself. It's divided into different levels, mm -hmm. uh, preschool. Tell us the dynamics, what's, what's, what's actually happening on the ground. So we, like I said, we have preschool, and it's campus on itself, and we have primary school, another campus. How many children in preschool? Our preschool holds 100, maximum mm -hmm. capacity of 100, then mm -hmm. our, our primary holds maximum 900, and then secondary, we up to 200. Mm -hmm. So that's the campus that we have running right now. And the proposition, even though they're on different campuses and they're on different ages, what we see is, we see the whole um, value chain as a continuum. So at age four, they come into the system, but from age four, we should be introducing them to computing, to writing, to creativity, to all the disciplines and the possible paths that they can take. As they get older, the complexity increases. But really, at the end, they should be able to look back and say, when I first came, I had no idea what a computer was, mm -hmm. but I can now build a computer mm -hmm. at age 10 or at age 15. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're doing at the Dow Academy, because we really want to say, if children are going to give us 13 years of their lives, and parents are going to give us 13 years of school fees, then at the end, these children should be able to do something meaningful mm -hmm. and contribute in the world, no matter what their next stage opportunity is. And, and that's the part that I, I want us to dig, dig deeper in. What, what is the, um, I guess we'll deal with it in, in, in greater detail as we go along, but for now, uh, is there a quick value proposition mm -hmm. that you can say, look, this is a differentiator for Dow Academy from the other academies, from the other schools? Mm -hmm. um, yes. There's a very, very compelling proposition to come to the Dow Academy, and that is really that we are reimagining education, and we are sincerely and genuinely innovating in the space of education. We are harnessing the skills, the talents, the abilities of people here and abroad to actually contribute to your child's education sitting in Mutrudi Botswana, and that is incredible. Our kids right now, as I speak, are getting a chance to rebuild desktops, rebuild lab, and I mean to take them apart, the whole thing, and put them back together. At what age? At age, last year was standard seven. This year we also have standard seven, and we have form twos and form threes actually rebuilding desktops. And that is incredible. I mean, like, can you imagine? Right now your phone is a black box, your computer is a black box. But it doesn't have to be. And for, and for so long as we treat them that way, kids will never think they can impact the world. So mm. that's what our kids are doing right now. Our mm. standard four kids, that's age nine and 10, they're learning how to code, write computer code, introductory coding. Really? Yes, really. And mm. they're learning. Last year we started with a video conference professor sitting in the United States who dials in in the afternoon and has a video conference with these kids to teach them how to code. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing what kids will actually pick up and lean into if you give them a chance. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's compelling. We're saying there are skills in the world that need to be brought into basic education. And we are the school that makes that possible. Wow, that's, that's great. And, and, and uh, can you talk a little bit about the state of education in Botswana that may be contributed for you to say, it's about time that I step to the plate and do something? 
Um, I, I mean, like I said, I went to both government and public. So I went to Bakhatle CJSS, and, and I look back on that time, and, and, I, and I realized when I went to university, even back then, that I felt like, I felt like basic education could have done more to prepare me to be in the world. And that has only, that belief and conviction has only got, gotten stronger with time. I was in corporate, like I said, so I did work in um, different departments and different industries. And what I saw when a job was advertised, first of all, the, there's like reams and reams of CVs, okay? Mm. And then there's nothing distinguishing one CV really from the next. And these kids are out there desperately looking for a job, but when, you, when, you, when they put you in an office, you can't make a decision. Is this the right child? Is this not the right child? What are you really offering? Mm. So for me, I said there's something, there's a disconnect between how we're preparing them to show up. Because ultimately, education is facilitating these young people to be in this community. And for me, that's what I really would like to see. And I think at 18 years old, mm -hmm. I mean, these kids can join the army. They can go to war. Okay, mm -hmm. some countries, they can vote. Mm -hmm. If they can do that, then they by certainly God, can they, vote here. Yeah, yes, they can vote at they 18. should be able to contribute to this country they're making decisions about. And I think basic education needs to do a better job of preparing them for that mm -hmm. conversation and for that experience. Okay. Can I just ask your mother what some point was a minister of uh, basic education? Did this um, experience influence some of the decisions or some of the things you're doing now? It actually did. I was, uh, I was very excited. I really was when she became minister of basic education. I saw all these possibilities of how it could all just become so amazing. Mm. But ultimately, um, I mean, big government is a big organization and therefore it's, it's difficult to change things fast and to, to move fast, which is the reality of big entities. But what I did find very beneficial about that time is the amount of information that came through. Just regards to the number of schools in the country, the challenges teachers are facing, the infrastructure challenges, the textbook challenges, what kids are actually, um, what was working, what is not working, that was just amazing because it is a lot of information that can be garnered if somebody's in that space. Mm -hmm. So for me now, when I look at the challenges that teachers are having around um, CPD. For us, we are working to actually, we are partnering with the University of Cincinnati to, to, mm. to design a program for them to continue to learn because it is an area that we know teachers would like to further develop, but it's not always easy for them to facilitate. So that it was actually very, very informative and it's mm. been very beneficial. Mm. So it was yeah. difficult, but it was actually worth the, the journey. This notion or this idea of getting kids at a young age to code, mm. I've read that they do that in Japan, you know, even at kindergarten. Mm. Where, did you, where are the best practices where that, that you're looking at in mm. terms of the world mm. that may have said to you that, look, it's time mm. to reimagine the system and do it differently? Okay, so for me, I mean, if you look online anywhere, you'll see all kinds of amazing things that children, young children are doing who are no different really from our kids. And mm. the question that I always had in my mind was why? Why is it happening in Japan and not here? Mm. I mean, why? What is really materially different? And nothing that was different was just that people were making decisions and then they were implementing them. So for me, when I, I, mean, I did coding in, in university, it was the first time I saw coding, and it was just amazing to think, what, I can actually influence a computer? But by then I was 18 years old, mm. and the people I was in class with, they had known it was possible all along, and I was thinking, okay, something is clearly missing from mm. my basic education. Mm. But for me, what really what struck me, because I went to school abroad, was that I didn't want our kids to keep going out to the world apologetic, hat in hand, mm. about where they came from and what they've learned. I mean, no. And especially in today's world, where the world is so connected, you can learn absolutely anything. Mm. You may not get a certificate at the end, but whatever skill you want, it is available on the internet. And mm. if that's possible, then why can't we open up what's happening in our schools? Because, mm. and then the reality also that really has come to the fore a lot is that there are a lot of people, I mean, even yourself, I mean, us give, you giving us this platform is you supporting education. Mm. There are people who are prepared to lean in with whatever little they have yeah. to make it better. And we're mm. saying we are here ready and willing mm -hmm. for that to, to happen on our campuses for our kids. Let's talk about financial education. Mm. I'm asking this because every entrepreneur that you meet laments the fact that our people don't know anything about financial education and they regret the fact that the system is not there. Mm. You've read books like uh, Cash Flow Quadrant, mm. books like Rich Dad, Poor, Poor Dad, Dad yeah. where everybody laments the international educational system. Mm. Uh, and and the, one, one businessman was even saying, Look, I've been so successful borrowing money from banks, but never once did a bank manager ask me about trigonometry or my <laughs> grades or any of the things I was, I was learning at school. Mm. So building on that, what is the approach of Dow Academy or what's your thinking mm. on how we can enhance financial education? 
Um, actually, it's funny you mentioned that because yesterday we were just um, agreeing with FNB is going to be coming through actually to our school to support financial literacy in, in, in our schools. And, if, and surprisingly, last week I got a call from my ex-schoolmate um, from my master's, and he's actually in Russia, okay? This gentleman is sitting in Russia, sent me a message on and LinkedIn, and he's like, look, can I do anything to support? And of course, his degree, his training's in finance as well. So actually, we're scheduling a call as well. He's gonna be doing a, a guest lecture for our kids talking about financial money. Because mm -hmm. money is, it's one of those things that is money, building a house, buying a house, mm. getting a job, being interviewed, these are things that are critical, mission critical. And the first time you actually are forced to deal with them is when you're an adult. It makes absolutely no sense, I agree. When you've already graduated, yes. yeah. So for us, all those things are things that we want to solve in the here and now for the mm. kids. So financial literacy is going to become a part of um, the program. I mean, we have mechanics coming next term. Actually, there's an old military DAF truck that's part of secondary school. Second term, those kids are going to make that car run, and that mm. is their project. Mm. But it makes them feel powerful, but it also makes them realize they can solve real world problems. Mm. And that's why we're really pushing at the Dow Academy. Let's talk about curricula. I mean, obviously, these pupils have to uh, sit an exam and they have to go through the system of education as is. Mm. What are you guys doing to change the curriculum? Because mm. it's no point to them becoming experts and then they are prevented from maybe passing to university because that thing is not in the curriculum. Mm. What are you doing for curriculum development in that regard? Okay. Our head of school is a gentleman called Mr. Nagar Muteto, actually. Mr. Uh, say that again. Mr. Muteto. Yeah. He used to work at basic education in curriculum development. So he was actually part of the, the, the team that was developing the multiple pathways curriculum for the government and then outcome-based education. Mm. So for us, I mean, he was the perfect choice for our head of school just because of his experience. He's a teacher, he was a teacher trainer, all the experience has gone around the world to see what people are doing and doing well. So our, one of our strategy, strategy points this year is curriculum review. So one of the things that we're doing is actually looking at both primary and secondary curriculum to actually create a multiple, path, multiple pathways based curriculum with outcome based education. The reality, like you're saying, is that we are regulated, we are a school, so kids do need to have assessments that uh, you know, that's, um, will pass master, that people will feel like kids are developing. Mm. So while at the end they may take IGCSE, we see a future where children, even along the way, they can actually get a Microsoft certification along the way. I mean, they're at school, we can mm. facilitate the learning, they can still get a, a certificate in, in Microsoft, in Google, whatever it is that they need, other ancillary skills. Mm. So we are actually changing the curriculum. This year we're, we're reviewing it. I mean, to be fair, the base is very solid. Mm. The, the children have been, the school is 27 years old before we mm. took it over. So the kids have been doing very well. They passed PSLE every year. Last year they were number one in, in the district. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. We're mm. very proud of our babies, especially because it was COVID. So mm. it was a tough, tough year for everybody. Mm. IGCSE did incredibly well. 80% C, C plus to A, C to A star and in really tough subjects. So mm. our, our teachers know what they're doing and they do what they do well. Now the question is how do we take that, make, take what is good and make it great and make it excellent. And that's really what we're laying on top, hence the curriculum work. Yeah, I suppose the challenge for curriculum makers is how much of history do you need to know? How much of biology do you need to know? Mm. For instance, do, I, do we really need to know the details of how the First World War was won mm. and the Second World War? But then we know that there's a po popular saying that if you don't know history, you are doomed to repeat it. Yes. And you ha we have to know some of the information is, is, is useful. Mm. But how do you strike a balance? The right amount of history, mm. the right amount of biology, the right amount of this, as well as enough education relating to the world, the things that you can use mm. uh, as, 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 uh, in terms of the examples you, give, you gave. Striking that balance is the biggest challenge, isn't it? It is a huge challenge. But yeah. one of the things also, um, history, what people say about history, the way we learn about history is that we never learn from history. Mm -hmm. So while we may be told when World War I happened, what happened, who were the protagonists, what do we actually really learn given how it's presented, right? So for instance, um, last term we had a, a media club put together a short film. And the short film was inspired by the story of Matsieng. I don't know if you know Matsieng. Yes, yes, I do. The footprints. Yeah, and the Matsieng is down in Muchudi there. Yes, mm. and these kids, for the first time, listened with attention when somebody actually told them about Matsieng and the story. Because they were being given the opportunity to reimagine. So now we're in the future, Matsieng has already come onto the planet, onto the earth. Now what do we do? Those kids, now if you ask about Matsieng, they'll tell you the story of Matsieng. Mm. But before this, when you just told them as something abstract, Mm. and something they had to memorize. It had nothing to do with their life and what their interests were. Mm. So for us, I think the balance that we're seeking to create is to say trigonometry, quadratic equations may seem abstract and mm. have no meaning, but if you take trigonometry or physics mm. and say, okay, if I'm here's a truck, 
given what you've learned in physics, how do you think, how do you use what you've learned in physics to actually fix this car? Mm. Then it's different because the, it, the information matters. They need specific things that they can tie to an activity. And practice, as we all know, is, makes perfect and it reinforces learning. Mm. And that's the balance we're seeking to create. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, here's a, champ to, a chance to shamelessly plug uh, <laughs> your, your institution. Mm. What are your specific achievements so far? Mm. You've been in operation how long? We've been, the school is 27 years old, but as a Dow Academy, we're, we're 15 months old. Yeah, in yes. 15 months, what significant achievements have you made? Oh, we've done an amazing amount, since I'm shamelessly plugging. But the, the <laughs> truth is, um, the first thing is first. Last year was a COVID year, and I really i am very proud of the kids, of the teachers, of the staff, and, and how well they kept the kids safe. I mean, we didn't have our first case really until October, and that's quite amazing given what was going on last year. Mm. So for that, that is an, a, a fantastic achievement. And even now when we have a case, it's isolated, we, we deal with it and we move on and we keep mm. the kids going. Mm. And I said, as I said before, and even under those circumstances, our PSLE kids did amazing. Mm. Our IDCSC kids did fantastic. Our media club kids made a movie. Mm. Our standard seven kids rebuilt laptops, set them back there working there at home with their machines so they can tell you every single thing that's inside that machine. Mm. That is incredible for mm. me. Um, we, we launched what we call the, te the, the tech series, and the tech series is the umbrella where we do all these things. Text series. Tech, as in technology tech, and uh, technology. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So under this program is where we do our coding, our newspaper and journalism, our leadership skills, uh, all these amazing programs that we do. And what is incredible about the tech series is that we have more than 20 people right now who are not teachers, but who are experts and professionals in their own right. Mm -hmm. And these people, even though they have their normal lives, doing their normal businesses, whatever, they are giving of their time. Sometimes, some of them two hours, sometimes three hours, some of them for the, for the whole year, they're committed to come every yeah. afternoon to come and teach kids about leadership, about newspaper and journalism. People who are amazing, like BBC reporters, Botswana, mm -hmm. no less, eh? who have normal lives, but will still come to Busiri. You know what Busiri is if you're in Habron? It's a long drive. Mm. And this lady comes to school twice a week to come in Teach, they're put, putting out their first newspaper end of this month. Mm. And that is incredible. Like those relationships, we did not know uh, almost any of these people. Mm. This time last year, we didn't know them. Mm. But COVID created an opportunity for us to think differently about how can we work together? Where are the opportunities? Since we have some time, okay, we, we are sad that our businesses maybe are struggling, maybe are this, but it means I have time to mm. do other things. So I think that has been incredibly amazing. Wow. Still on the COVID dividend. Mm. Um, the online, your online uh, teaching methodology, mm. what is your approach and how have you transitioned mm. to handle that to the point where you're now even excited about COVID? <laughs> mm. um, to be honest, COVID, I mean, online learning is, I mean, it's, it's great if it can happen. But the reality is kids need gadgets. They need, de they need machines. They need some sort of interface tool and they need internet connectivity. And we're in Mutrid. Mm. The bulk of our kids do not have gadgets and they do not have necessarily access to internet. And during that first lockdown, when th that two months one in, in March, one, the yeah. big one, yeah, mm -hmm. we were sitting there thinking, what are we going to do? Because mm. we, I mean, we threw around all kinds of ideas. Do we get buses and get internet and park them in central locations so kids can plug in? Like, how do we solve this problem? Mm. And that's where we came up with the idea. Well, you know what? Okay, fine. For this round, we can't solve it, but for the future, we can. And that's mm. what we decided. Oh, you know what? We're actually going to get kids to rebuild machines and to keep them. Because the reality is everybody was lamenting the lack of laptops in kids' hands. But I'm like, across Khabaroni, there are storerooms full of decommissioned laptops that are three years old. They're, there's nothing wrong with them, right? Mm. And the question is, how do we get those machines into the hands of children? Mm. Maybe they need to be fixed, that's fine, mm. but we can facilitate that. But how do we get those machines in the hands of kids? And that's how we got up, came up with the idea to, to the rebuild the laptop. Mm. So we had um, our first 10 machines came from Bazaar Life, mm. actually. Um, a lovely gentleman called Waizi, my relationship manager, <laughs> I told him. Just donated. Yeah, yeah, we got them from mm. Life. And the, it, yeah. I mean, it was either that or the landfill, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> it really was. And okay, fine, there were some things. They took out the, the hard drive. We mm. bought hard drives, the kids took them apart, they put them back together, they recommissioned them, and they have machines. Mm. Okay, it's 10 machines, but the idea is to create enough of a buzz that every year, every time a big company retires, because we know they retire, after three years, people get new machines. Mm. Why are they not going to kids' hands? And we want to be And do you then upgrade them? Yeah, no, we got new hard drives for them, the kids mm. set them up, and mm. the kids keep them. Like once they fix them, they keep them. Yeah. But what we want to get to a point is where we have a steady supply of machines, the kids fix them, and they move on to the kids who need them. Mm. Because the thing is, we are in an area, we're in a community. So the other mm. primary schools, other schools around us that need machines. And we can be the school that makes it possible for your machine that's in your storeroom. You've got some in your uh, storeroom. Well, Even if it's one machine. Now that you mention <laughs> it, yes, yes. You can talk about that after the show. Mm. Tell me, you still have the issue of internet connectivity. How yes. do you solve it when somebody is in maybe Matubudukwane mm. or 
What are the other surrounding villages there? Yeah, I mean, right now for us, we spent a small fortune um, connecting the, all three campuses. So we got a dedicated line from Bofinet. And the three campuses are? Uh, the reception campus in primary and then secondary. And, and where where are they the located? Campus? So um, the preschool and primary are near Katling Land Board. You know that area, B6, yes, yes. Up? Yep. And then the secondary is all the way past Muli, about a kilometer and a half mm -hmm. on the right. On the yes, I know yes. those areas. Mm -hmm. So those are the three where the okay. schools are. And so we got... And the third, you said? No, the, the preschool and the primary are together. Mm -hmm. They're across okay. the world from each other. Okay, all right, no problem. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So we spent a lot of money to connect from Bofinet, and we're very grateful. And we have a great service, and so the kids can actually... So there's internet all over our campuses. Mm. And we really, when during that first lockdown, we really thought, uh, we could think, okay, if we can solve the machine issue... So they're not really studying from home? No, they're not studying from home. I mean, oh. they have the normal homework. But right now, we don't do we don't do online. We do. I mean, they come to school every day because yeah. for us, we, we're managing to keep the campuses safe. Mm -hmm. But we we had two problems to solve. One was the technology problem. The other was connectivity. Technology. If we can get more machines from people sitting to the south, mm -hmm. then we can slowly solve the technology problem. Yeah. The internet. We have internet. And, and just like you would actually go to a drive-in movie, there's no reason why you can't drive into our campus effectively mm. if you're a student and sit there and do your work. Mm. If we need to get to that point. But for now, um, without connectivity, like pervasive connectivity, it makes it very difficult for kids to learn online. Mm. Mm. What are you working on and um, your future plans in terms of uh, taking this further? I know that 15 months is a bit short, but I'm sure you do have uh, some kind of crystal ball that tells you what the future holds. Yes, I do. <laughs> and the ball is very, very clear. <laughs> it's showing me an uh, international boarding school. Mm -hmm. world-class boarding school in Busija. That's what that, my crystal ball is showing. Mm. So right now, we are working very hard mm. to raise the money. We've got the plans, we've got the drawings, we're dealing, we have all kinds of balls in the air, but our view, our plan is to have children in a world-class boarding facility in Mutrit mm -hmm. beginning 2022. Okay. Yes, because our view is that quality education, international, world-class, excellent education is not, about it's not about geography. It's about the people who make the dream work. Mm -hmm. And our team, I mean, both the people we found at the school we got there and the new ones, they're really working together to drive the values and to deliver a quality product. How do you handle the issue, challenges around physical infrastructure, the mm. costs involved mm. in expanding and building physical buildings? Actually, to be honest, it's actually a lot more challenging than I thought. I mean, people who have People who are in business, they know, I mean, they've seen the balance sheet. You just do basic calculations. How many kids are here? How much is the tuition? How much do the expenses cost? It makes sense financially, right? Mm. But one of the things that I, I'm finding I'm having to overcome in many companies is the appreciation that the infrastructure must be built. Mm. I mean, it does need to be built because a school Physically, is, yes, yes, physically. A school is children, it's teachers, but it's also the, the infrastructure. Mm. And right now, that's the sell, the plug that I'm making to the banks, the financiers mm. to say, invest in the infrastructure. It's mm. fairly a once-off investment, but after that, the dividends are very, very clear. So it, it is a long walk, but I think it's a worthwhile walk. And frankly, mm. I, I have utmost faith in the team. And I do know that all of us, I mean, if you're a Motswana born and bred in this country, mm. you know what a good education means mm. to anybody across this country. No matter what their circumstances, you know what that means. Mm. And if I can just get people to remember what the amount of value that education unlocked for them, then we are more than halfway there. So is it basically an English medium school? Yes, it is an English medium school. Okay. And yeah, it is. And how, what, what are the challenges associated with people now forgetting their, their home language and, mm. and losing the, the touch, the stronger touch? Isn't that the cry mm. that our, this generation is, the millennials, mm. they can't even speak Sichuan? Yes, no, it is, it is a real challenge and it's something that I take very, very seriously. I mean, at, at, at um, the Dow Academy, mm. Sichuan starts from standard one. Mm -hmm. So, and it's not optional, you take Sichuan. Mm -hmm. And I've actually, we've got, um, for, for primary, we've got seven Sichuan teachers. Mm -hmm. So, at every level has a teacher. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we are very, very committed to. I have a two-year-old child and I, make no mistake, my child will speak Sichuan mm. as a first language and I remind them every day that my mm. child is coming in two years, mm. so you need to be delivering a quality product. Mm. So, I, 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 I went to school abroad, like I said, and mm. I know know the identity is a very very important thing it's a very grounding thing and to be at sea in that way is something that is it's very damaging for a mm. long time mm. so and I do think it is even if it wasn't Sichuan even if it was Japanese or Chinese whatever language mm. it is important to experience the world through more than just one lens okay. and Sichuan is one of those languages that is incredible in many many ways if you actually think about it quite critically and try to compare it with other languages mm. and it, it allows you to think about things to talk about things and to experience things in a way that English will not yes. and even if it's just for that sake for the sake of learning alone mm. it is worth learning the language okay. so we are very committed to that task all right. We're talking about innovation here, and you have partners mm. um, in who you work with. Who are your partners, and how are they uh, fulfilling your mission mm. of innovation? 
Um, so our part, I've already mentioned the University of Cincinnati. So like I said, they're supporting coding for our standard four kids. How so? They're, so our, we have um, a gentleman called Mohammed El Waqib. He's actually Egyptian mm. by origin, but he's a, he's a PhD professor in the University of Cincinnati who teaches computer science. Mm. And he's the one who teaches our standard four kids. In, uh, in, in Ohio. Ohio, yes, yes, of course, yeah. So he does that, and he's doing it for the second time again this term. Mm. Um, we have, like I said, we have more than And he's in Ohio as Yeah, he's speak. in Ohio. Today's so it's strictly online. It's strictly online, yes. Okay. So we have high-speed internet. We've got a lovely projector, lovely camera, video conference. He sees all the kids. The kids ask questions. So most as if he's here. Yes, yes, it is. It's, and what, it's and live. It's, yeah, it's live. For him, it's late. Because for us, it's 3 o'clock. Mm. But there, what? No, for him it's very, very early because we do it at 3 o'clock. So yes, we are very early on his end to actually teach the class mm. and the kids here. But he loves it and, he, and he's doing it for a second time around. Mm. And he's now, we want it to be every, sometimes offered every term. So that's University of Cincinnati. Mm. They also, um, this coming term, we're working together to put together a continued professional development program for our teachers because teaching on the job is very important mm. and they have a school of education in the U.S. And then also, which is really we're very excited about, is they're actually getting uh, graduate students, university students, to get together to solve... UB a, students? No, in, in America. Oh. Multidisciplinary teams to mm. solve a business challenge in the Dow Academy. So we're their client, mm. beginning 1st of April. Mm. So we're putting together some challenges for them to solve. And the best, challenge, the, the best solution is the one that we're going to implement on this side. So that's okay. incredible. Um, and then we've got, like I said, a lot of individuals. So we've got, I mean, I can't name them all because there's so many. I mean, like mm. the lady who does our newspaper and journalism, her name is Yvonne. And she actually works for BBC. She just mm. happens to be in Botswana because of COVID. Mm. So she's teaching the kids journalism, how to prepare paper, how to research, how to interview, mm. all these things is incredible. Mm. The gentleman who teaches our kids coding, um, no, who teaches rebuild the laptop and desktop and mm. IT skills, a gentleman mm -hmm. called Eddie. And we met, we didn't even meet. It was LinkedIn. He sent me a message in the middle of the night. Mm. I woke up, I saw this message. I responded by 2 o'clock that afternoon. He was at school saying, I mm. can help. What can, I can help. Mm. How can I help? How can I help? Yes. Mm. And mm. our... Our financial literacy, our leadership program, we've got um, our branch manager from Airport Junction. Her mm. name is Petzo. She's in the mix. She yeah. comes to come and teach our kids. And she's made a three-year commitment. Uh, for months, she started a leadership training. Mm. Over three years, she's taken them on a journey. She's a mm -hmm. certified Maxwell coach. I mean, there's so many. I can't, mention, I can't possibly mention them all. You talked about a certified Maxwell coach mm. for kids in mm. primary and secondary school. Mm. What are they coaching on? Is it personal development now? What's yes. happening there? There's the one, there's, um, there's, a, there's a youth part of Maxwell. There's a large one because we're adults. We know about the adult program. So they actually have a Maxwell youth, um, mm. youth challenge space. So they do things like confidence, influencing. Which sort is of, very important, yeah, very, especially very, for entrepreneurship. Yes. Sort yeah. of how to show up, you know, how to actually be present, to be in the room, to not apologize kind of like for who you are, mm. to have better relationships. So Petra is doing that. She's been, she started three weeks ago. With our tell you. So you're actually in partnership with my hero, John Maxwell. Yes, well, indirectly, but yes. Yes, yes. yes. His academy, mm, yes. which he set up, I mean, mm. which is still part of his larger organization. Yeah. And in fact, end of April, we're having um, the Global Youth Initiative. So mm. we're going to actually be hosting um, a three day program for young people 14 to 18 years old. We haven't advertised yet, we just decided yesterday. So um, if you're listening, you get to hear first. Yeah, yeah. So we'll put out a call for, so we're going to have 10 kids from Wilipi. 10 from us and then 5 from Greater Habroni. Mm. So it'd be free of charge. The kids come and they spend two and a half days in a, in a, in a so Maxwell program. So what you're program. telling me at Dow Academy, you are making a deliberate effort to promote personal development, yes. issues of confidence, issues of self-esteem. You're focusing on that. Why? Why do you think that is important? Because you can train for skill at any age, I, I believe. But attitude is something that comes from early childhood and it must be influenced and it must be nurtured from very early on. Kids who are, whose confidence is broken or who are really hurt in some bad way when they're kids, it takes them many, many years to repair that damage. Mm. But if we can, from a very early age, teach these kids courage, teach them to protect their courage, to protect their peace, then it's something that no matter what challenges come, they are actually the feel future. like they can actually influence them. Mm. I mean, we just started uh, last week, we made a decision to have, um, we're calling a mental health coach, but basically we have a, a counselor who comes to secondary school mm -hmm. four days a week. Uh, we just started last week. So basically we, all the kids now, she's doing rounds with all the kids. First, we have to destigmatize the idea that mental health is something that you can't talk about. That's yeah, one. Yeah. And then we have to go through everybody and say, okay, guys, we need to have helpful, supportive, constructive conversations about things that we're struggling with. Mm. Because the reality is the last 12 months, there's so much that is weighing mm. people down. So because we are being very, COVID yeah, in. because of COVID and of course, economic income, loss of life, there's just so many things that people are carrying. Mm. So for us, we think 
if we can, you know how kids, babies, like small children, mm. they're so brave, eh? Mm. And they're so creative and they're just full of life and full of energy, right? Mm. And slowly we take this away in small things. Yes. So if we can. As they get older. As they get older. So we, we tell them, we can't do this, you can't, can't do yeah, this. You're going to fall. Go, what? Don't talk. Yeah, yeah. You don't interrupt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. things. Mm. And they chip away at kids. So we are really trying to create a space and we're mm. creating a space where we want to keep them whole for as long as possible. Mm. Life is hard out there, we agree. Yeah, yeah. But like, can we just teach them earlier on to say, okay, I'm overwhelmed or I'm stressed out or I need help or I can do this and is I'm that sure part I can of the student learner support program yes and we just started that this year so like I said we just started two years ago because two, two weeks ago because we we're really trying to think about what's the best way to actually learn a support we can do the lead the the leadership training, the, that is good, right? Because we're, we're promoting confidence, influence, you're powerful, you can do stuff. But mm -hmm. then also want to have a mental health conversation that allows you to say, mm -hmm. even though I am confident, today mm -hmm. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Today I'm feeling stressed. Today I need help because mm -hmm. of whatever it is. Because it's nice for people to be confident, but you, you can't be confident all the time. Mm -hmm. But you do need the language that allows you to talk about when you need help. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to balance for our, for our kids. Okay. Um, there's a gentleman called... Uh, uh, on Shark Tank, mm -hmm. we call him Mr. Wonderful. I'm trying to remember his name. He started an education mm. and then he packaged his uh, business and then sold it mm. and made a killing. Mm. Uh, he calls it a major liquidity event. Um, so that suggests to me that if properly approached, education can be really a lucrative, mm. lucrative undertaking. Mm. Speaking to entrepreneurs out there, help me understand and help them understand how education can be a career an entrepreneurial mm. career mm. which um, which can lead to uh, what I just mentioned the liquidity events can actually create cash big dollops of money mm. okay well dollops of money are very important we all got bills mm. but um, so I'm, 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 I'm gonna use an example actually from South Africa there's a, 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 um, a chain of schools called Sparks schools and Spark Schools, I actually met the founder, not that I'm talking about a company, but I met the founder, I think four or five years ago in, in Mauritius. Mm. The African Leadership Academy had this great event where they call influencers, power people from across the continent to get together, talk about Africa's problems and how we're gonna solve them. Mm. And I remember this lady, she was you know, a smaller lady, she was talking about Spark Schools and her, she said, you know what, I am sure that for the amount of money costs the government, South African government, to, to, to fund the education of one child, mm. that exact amount I can deliver a better product. I'm not charging more than what it costs government to educate one child, but I still say at that price tag, we can still deliver something quality. And that was four or five years ago. Mm. Um, I think a month ago, she just got huge funding from Finland, three, fin three funders, one from Finland, one from mm. the US, and I think one from France. Mm. And they're going across Africa to get to 35 students across. I mean, they're attracting private equity, big money, mm. to actually take a working model of delivering a quality product. The product that happens to be education, mm. to take it across the region. So the opportunities are, are there in, a, in abundance. Mm. And ultimately, when you think about a school, I mean, a school is everything. I mean, it's people, mm -hmm. it's kids, it's infrastructure, and, and physical and technological. Mm. It's, and it's a school, and therefore, you, because it's a primary school, think of kids only. But it's, it's infrastructure that allows you, that mm. infrastructure by itself sits idle for, a, every year it sits idle for more than 90 days. Mm. More, actually, maybe even more than 150 days, when you think about how much time. Mm. That asset, because generally schools tend to be government Why assets. Why is it idle for that long? Because uh, uh, during April, schools are closed. Eh? Yes. We lock the doors mm. and go home. Mm. But I mean, th that could be, we could actually run parallel schools. You could have schools that run August, April, and December mm. because the kids aren't there. Yeah. You could have schools that run in the evening because the kids aren't there. Mm. You can have, I mean, the, the halls, it's still a property portfolio, mm. even though it is a school. Mm. So the opportunities are just really endless. And even the resources, I mean, the books, the copiers, the papers, and the, we consume so much. Security, mm. like our security bill is, okay, I want to talk about security. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm just saying that as a school, we may, people may just think we educate small kids, but mm. the amount of money that school puts back into the economy in terms of supporting other businesses, mm -hmm. and the amount of value that sits there that is not tapped, is mm. incredible. Mm. I think we just need to let go of, shake this thing loose, what a school calls a desk, a child, and a teacher looking forward. I assume mm. it's different with the academy. Yes. Yes, it's different. We won't go into the numbers, but mm. it's different. Mm. The approach is totally different in the sense that you are, it's profit making. Mm. You're taking advantage of all these other, uh, you know, possibilities of, yeah. why should Dow Academy be a go-to school going forward? It should be a go-to school because we are, our, our mission and our vision is very, very clear. So we are growing problem solvers. Mm. We are reimagining education. And that means every day, 
all 92 of us, and that's how many of us there are working at the Dow Academy. Just get the up. staff? Yes, just the staff. And uh, how many students? 700? Yeah, said? 740, yes, students. Yeah, yeah. So we get up every day mm. to reimagine this. We get up every day to, when the marketing um, officers put a design forward, the, the newspaper is going to look like this. Mm. Our feedback is, is it creative? What are you reinventing here? This looks like... Same old, same yeah, old. Yeah, same old. So it needs to look better and be better and more better. Mm. And we are a place where if you are a professional, quality professional mm. and you are interested in giving of your time of your energy mm. then we are going to facilitate that learning because ultimately we are preparing these children to work for you first of all mm. and if you don't tell us what you need they want to give you square holes for round pegs. Yeah, yeah, yes yeah. so that's the kind of sp space that and dialogue that we're, we're in well it, it, well maybe then you should say how you are interacting with the you know the would-be employers in mm. terms of you know the market out there mm. to ensure that what you're producing is suitable. Mm -hmm. What mechanisms are there to interact with the market? Okay, um, to be fair, COVID is a challenge because we can't really have too many trips. But for the newspaper and journalism crew, there's two weeks back during midterm break, they went to The Voice mm -hmm. and they went to um, the Weekend Post, just to see the newsroom. Mm -hmm. And we've actually, we're setting up a, a tele radio station at uh, the wow. primary school, so we're very excited. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, one of the newspapers is doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna be sharing experience with regards to what works and what does not work, so that's incredible. Mm -hmm. The kids get to learn about that. Mm -hmm. um, for our film kids who did the movie last year, we had a movie premiere. Wow. A short, yes. What's we had the name a, of the movie? The Sword of Maturity. We're very proud of our the film. The Sword of Maturity. Yes. What's we had it a about? Print. It's about, um, so basically the story is about, you know, my Tieng and Louis, right? Yes. Yeah, the giants beneath the earth, they came about. So these kids got a chance to say, okay, we're now in the present day, in the future, and what has happened to the legacy of my Tieng? Who, mm -hmm. is the, who is still surviving from that line? And what are they doing in the world? Mm -hmm. So they, we had a script, we had a movie, we shot a film, short film. We had a premiere at Capital Cinemas beginning of the wow, year. Wow, wow, We are actually I now... I interrupted you. You have to get back to your oh, other point. Yes. Which was to say... Um, Industry. Yes. Yes. Mm. So, but, but the point about the film is that right now, that movie is on UPIC. It's mm. on, we just yesterday, it went live on Credi TV. And mm. it's an American streaming service. So we're now in America and Canada, if you can wow. believe it. Mm. The kids cannot believe mm. that they're in the world. Mm. But it also means they'll get real feedback about their product. Mm. So the kids who are genuinely interested in media and film, they're going to get constructive feedback to develop their craft. And you think could about have how to a future it. Steven Spielberg come from Dow Academy. Yes, she's already oh. there, by the way. I've, oh. I've met her. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, <laughs> but anyway, that's so, good. So that's what we do. And then in terms of like bringing the outside into, into the world, so we had, I mean, we have guest speakers. So we have like, um, we had a vet come, mm -hmm. Mr. Um, actually, my vet, his name's Bati, he's in mm. Pagalanti. Yeah. He came to talk to the kids about how a chicken makes an egg, but more than that, he came mm. to talk about how do you become a vet, what do you need to do to get prepared. Mm. So people just come because they actually want to lend their experience yeah. and their time. If you invite me, I'm, I'm happy yes, to come. Yes, you invited. To sir. come and share whatever you want me Please. to share on. Yes, yes. Now, can you now summarize some few take homes mm. from this conversation? What do you want to leave the viewer with generally on the subject of educational, mm. innovation and education? Um, I think what I want to leave, and I know I want to leave with the viewers, is that innovation in education is mm. overdue. Mm. It really is overdue, and we all know that, because we all, I mean, if you did PSLE however many years ago, and it's still PSLE, you're asking, do we need to innovate? We know that we need mm. to innovate. Mm. It's overdue. But what it's I long past it's, time. It's long past time, but we, and we all know that. But I think what, what I really want to leave with the viewer is the, the knowledge, the good news. Mm. Okay, the very, very brilliant news mm. that um, the work is being done. And I'm sure we're not the only ones in the country. I know that. I don't, mm. I don't know where they are, but I know people are innovating. But it is a global movement to actually innovate in education. Mm. We're doing the work. We are, we are inviting anybody and everybody who's a professional of caliber, high, high caliber, because we are strict. We do deal with children. And who we expose our kids to is very important. Mm. But we will create an opportunity for us to actually work better and prepare kids for the future. Mm -hmm. um, we are building a boarding school, so we expect um, that we will be live beginning of next year, and Muchuli Boseja, to be exact, will be the place to go. Wow. And the, the last one I have to make a plug for is machines. For all you corporates with mm. all those machines collecting dust, desktops, laptops, mm. those machines can be refurbished mm. and they can be put in the hands of kids. And they can be refurbished by kids. Okay, not necessarily. Do you, do, you, do, you, um, do you announce that in your websites and yes. social media? Mm. I think you need to make it clear to mm. the public. To the, yeah, to yeah. the public. All right. Now, here's your chance to ask me a question, any question. Okay, um, so here's my question. We, mm. at the Dow Academy, our values are courage, creativity, and community, right? Mm. So clearly, you're creative, otherwise, I mean, you are a lawyer. So wow. you, how mm -hmm. would you find yourself in front of a video and doing this kind of work so that speaks to your creativity? And it is a brave thing mm. to put your thoughts and your opinions in the world, yeah. because the world can be quite critical. Mm. And 
it does help build communities. I mean, this lending us your platform, giving us this opportunity to share our story, that's an incredible thing. What I want to understand from you is what inspired you? Why do you feel you need to give back in this way? Well, a number of things. I, the need was there, obviously. Mm. Um, because I would go to YouTube, I'd go to any platform, it's all foreign programs. Mm. There's very little content coming from local and the need was there and I could see that something needs to be done. Mm. And normally my attitude to things is that do what you can. Don't mm. wait for the government, don't wait for somebody to do something. So that was the thinking. Mm. We also had a track record in the sense that we had for many years had a program at Duma mm. called Meet the Overcomers. Mm. I started this program in 2008. I ran it physically myself for two and a half years until I handed it over to, uh, to Mr. Mazani. Mm. So um, it's still running. It's actually one of the longest running shows on, uh, on radio. I think it's one of the 14th year now or something like that. No, 13th year. So um, where we, like the name implies, we meet overcomers, people mm. like you. So every week we do that once a week. But radio is radio. Mm. And um, the youth of our country are no longer radio enthusiasts like they were then when I started. So, but there's still a loyal following on radio. So mm -hmm. the thinking is that while one company, which is my other company called Speaks Volumes, is pushing the message on radio, mm -hmm. why don't I now start through this other entity, Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom, and share the message of entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is something I'm very passionate about. Mm -hmm. I live and I breathe it, it's in my DNA and I think of myself as a serial entrepreneur. Mm. So, um, and as you know, entrepreneurs are people who want to exchange information, they want to talk. So the other hidden advantage is that I get to learn. Mm. As, I'm t as I'm talking to you, I'm actually learning, I'm finding out so many things. In fact, I'm blown over. Until you came here, I didn't know anything about the Dow Academy. So that's another hidden, mm. quote unquote, hidden benefit to this show. So, I'm, I'm motivated and the idea is to give back to the community. It's not just about taking. Mm. I mean, this show, I have to pay for everything, all this, and you know, including the crew, mm. uh, that's an expense to us. But there's a huge, bigger reward. Look at the amount of impact we are having. Mm. Look at the kind of people that we are <laughs> attracting to ourselves. Mm. So that is really the, the motivation. I actually, when I started, did not think it would be as big as it is and as I, as I see it growing we're experiencing mm. actually exponential and explosive growth in terms of the impact we're having mm. i mean i have people from kazakhstan commenting on youtube people from russia mm. and it's reaching out to the u.s and everywhere so um i'm surprised myself as to how it, much it has grown but i think i've answered your question in so far as what mm. the initial motivation was mm. to give back and to expose um our overcomers as i'm doing today no, I, I really do want to thank you because mm. it's really a value that we want, that we are really driving with our kids because mm. I think we've become, a, there's a lot of noise about being individual and the I, the I, the I, the I, mm. but the reality is that nothing is built by one person. You can't do nothing without person. a team. Mm. You can never. There's yeah. no such thing as a self-made man or woman. No. Mm. So All right. really thank you. I'm going to switch and ask you to look at that camera. Okay. There's a young entrepreneur out there, there's a business person, there's someone in a desperate circumstance, there's someone who doesn't understand what we're talking about, who you may want to leave them with an inspirational message, mm -hmm. something uplifting, mm -hmm. um, and some hope. Okay. So here's a chance to speak to the viewer directly. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to, I think, maybe talk to the person who's desperate and feeling like they, they barely have one more breath left in them. Mm. And it's because we took over the school one January last year, so, and then COVID hit, right? Mm. So we had all these beautiful plans, these different beautiful projections about how our year was going to be, and then COVID shut us down end of March. And when we closed at the end of March, we did not know two very important things. When we would be open, if we would be able to reopen, and just how bad the situation was going to get. And I talk about this because I work with my sister and I, and I work with my brother-in-law. So which means in other families, if it was just me, if I got broke, then maybe I could call my sister for some money. <laughs> but if this thing went sideways, we were all broke, which means we're gonna have some serious, serious problems. And when we shut down in March, we really were very, very scared around what the future held. And we sat, we were home for two months. We continued to think, okay, um, the landscape has shifted significantly, 
but how do we still stay in the game? And I like to quote this thing that I read right before lockdown, which somebody wrote that you must be committed to the vision and not the model. And while... Say that again. We must be committed to the vision and not the model. Mm -hmm. And our vision was always very, very clear. We wanted to reimagine education. We wanted to grow problem solvers. Now, the how potentially was about to change significantly. And, and don't forget that this is off of the back of very serious loans to buy this school. So we were about to be in some serious problems, okay? Mm. But I think what got us through, what got us through every day, and we did get up every day and sat in the yard and sat in the yard like everybody else across the country. But we kept thinking, okay, fine. If this happens, what are we going to do? If this happens, what are we going to do? And okay, fine, there's these problems, but if we get back into the classroom, back to the kids, how are we going to solve this problem? And I think really coming out of that, what became very, very clear is the importance of teams and the resilience of people. And at the beginning, when we shut down for the first time, I sent a message to all the staff just saying, look, and I sent a video message because I was home, they were home, we couldn't even meet anyone. I said, look, we don't know how this is gonna end. We don't know how this is gonna end, but our job, what we have committed to do is to educate children. For now, that may mean over phone, it may mean over online, whatever that means, we are going to keep doing it because that is a Mission. promise we have made to these kids. Now, whether we'll have money in three months, six months, we don't know, but the vision is still very, very clear. Let's stay on message. And I will not lie to people who are desperate, who are down out, it is very, very difficult. It really, genuinely, truly is. And on most days, on many days, especially lately, because I'm feeling a little bit of COVID fatigue, like a lot of people, I get up because small things that other people do in the team just energize me. Like I go to work and I realize, oh my gosh, um, the Media Club kids did a, an interview today and it's really an amazing product. So your, the effort you put in over time, you may not see the returns of the big bangs, but you have to listen very carefully because you will get the feedback in varied ways that reminds you, you know what? Just keep putting one foot in front of the other because if you're not moving, then you may be dead. Yeah. So it's important to you keep, keep moving. moving. Keep moving. The best way through keep is moving through. Forward. Yeah. yeah, that's really the message that I want to send. That's a beautiful message. Thank, thank you, you very much. Mm. It remains for me to thank you and to thank the Dow Academy for, you know, for sacrificing its time to, to join us. Mm. And I love the product. I think you should go from strength to strength. To me, this is a highly scalable business. Yes. And you should focus on scale and grow from strength to strength. All the best. Thank you, sir, and thank you again.